unbelievable. The esports has been going crazy. Lots of releases. And we are just now coming back from the World of Warcraft Legion's game systems panel where I mean, so much information. My head is exploding. My head is exploding. My head's been exploding ah. for the last 48 hours. <laughs> uh, but we are so happy to have Chris Sigety, executive producer of StarCraft II, sitting at the desk. How are you, Chris? Good. How are you doing? It sounds like you're having a fun time, uh, which is great. Oh, we are having a blast. And congratulations, the launch of Legacy of the Void is nigh upon us, yes. I might say. Well, you guys just celebrating away, really. as well yeah. in the yeah, arena. We were, and that was really special because it's been really tough, to be honest to launch the game so close to BlizzCon like oh, this. Yeah. The amount of effort that goes into a BlizzCon is, is really overwhelming at times. And to, we're trying to figure out the right way to have some notes for this really, well, obviously near and dear to my heart, but I think the best community in the world, the StarCraft yeah. 2 community. Um, <laughs> and have a moment with them, and that's what, what that celebration was about. You know, is it kind of bizarre to you to think that this, this tournament that's currently happening is the very last part of the Swarm tournament that you're looking at? It is, it's, um, it's both, um, I guess, somewhat, there's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of bittersweet to it, but it's also very exciting. You know, I talked about this a little bit in, in our launch celebration event, but for me, Legacy of the Void really represents to StarCraft II what Brood War represented to the original oh, yeah. StarCraft. Yeah. All the component pieces are going to be there here in just two days. We're going to see this uh, eSport community now direct all attention towards what is a very, very different experience. It's so much faster paced. There's so many things that are going on. I'm so excited to see what they do with it. And then we're going to get this opportunity to really um, work with the community, with the pro community, with the players that are playing, and evolve StarCraft II in what we hope is the best strategy game out there, period. Bar none, our best effort ever, you know? So there's still this huge journey in front of us as well. Yeah, and it, I, so I was at the uh, cinematic release tr uh, party yes. in LA, and yeah. uh, heard you talking about the fact that you guys were initially, when talking about StarCraft II and the story of StarCraft yeah. II, wanting to put all of this into one game, which is unimaginable. Yeah, we, we literally yeah, could yeah. not have done it. it no was, way. It was, we, weren't, we would not have been able to tell the story we're trying to tell in the way we were doing it. So yeah. that's true. So, and this is now sort of the final chapter in this story yes, saga. Yes, exactly. Um, so that is definitely bittersweet as well. These are characters that are certainly near and dear to my heart. They do go back to the original StarCraft. Yeah. Characters like Raynor, like Kerrigan, Zeratul, uh, this glimpse into the Protoss struggle that they've had and Ire and their, their retaking of Ire. These, these are exciting times, but it is going to end a chapter in that story side. But... You are going to have more story. Exactly. It's not the end yeah, of yeah. Exactly. all story. Yeah, exactly. And that's an exciting announcement that we've made this weekend is that we have new content coming. Yeah. We have um, a story centered around Nova. And yeah, Nova Covert Ops, yeah, right? Yeah, Covert Ops, exactly. And it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to pick up on some things that really we couldn't really squeeze into the story of Legacy of the Void because it's telling this broader, bigger story, and now we can dive in. Um, I've heard Valerie, who's on the she's one of the primary writers of it, and she's talking about how excited she is to get this opportunity to explain some of the things politically that are going on. What happens yeah. at, the, at the result wow. of the end of Legacy of the Void? You know, the lore of StarCraft has always been something that I, that I love reading about because it's incredible. It really is. The love story between Raynor and Kerrigan and everything, it just kills me. Yeah. But I will say, that I watch it on a competitive level. Yeah. And for somebody like me, and I've always been very honest about this, StarCraft, I've always been slightly intimidated yeah. by it because I watch the pro players. And I know I'm never going to be a pro player, but with something like with Legacy of the Void coming out and Archon mode, for somebody that is new to the game, Will that be the best way to get into it, to not feel like I'm just going to get murdered when I get out there? Well, I, I think there's a couple things there. One is, yes, it's intimidating. It's intimidating to me to watch the pro level play. Yeah? It's one of the reasons I love to watch it. They are playing at such a high skill level yeah. um, that it, it's, it's hard to imagine yourself ever getting there, right? Yeah. People do it, but it's a journey that's I extreme. But I think for me, I, I step back and you have to realize that they are the best of the best. Yeah. Um, but that the game is built to work at your level, whatever level that is. And we've spent a lot of effort with Legacy of the Void, making it the best onboarding experience yet. They've completely revamped, the team has completely revamped how you get into the game, how it describes how to play Protoss, yeah. Zerg, cool. Terran, 
the campaign to answer for you, if you give it a shot, get in there. I'm and going play. to give it a shot. Yeah. I promise more <laughs> time that I would. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. Yes. So, but it does level up. It has a, it, it introduces the complexities of the game across time and that you can get better at that and start to understand it. And it, it slowly, as you do this, becomes less overwhelming to you. And then you can make the choice as a player. Do you really want to go in and play competitively on the ladder? Yeah. You don't have to. That is not what, that's not all that StarCraft is. StarCraft right. certainly has that. But I think people get caught up in it a lot because it is such an elite eSport. Oh, but yeah. There's it's like this the whole granddaddy other of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but there's this whole other game there. And, and the campaign is a huge way to get in there. These new modes, Archon mode that you spoke about is a really compelling way to learn with a partner. Get in the game, get somebody yeah, who does exactly. know. You just take these units out and start attacking the enemy and don't worry too much about it. I'll have some more for you in a moment. Yeah, um, Archon mode allows that. Uh, with our co-op missions that we've added to the game, that's another way to get into it. But in general, it's a mindset that I feel like does StarCraft does start uh, struggle with yeah. because there's these elite players are out there so much. But there's so many different ways to enjoy and yeah. play StarCraft. Well, we're also yeah, getting please. great Twitter questions coming in. Here's one from uh, at Vegas QC. Uh, I would personally love to know exactly what race slash league Chris Sigety plays in StarCraft II. Morheim had the similar question once, and this person loved it. So. So I Basically. play I play Terran. I'm a Terran I player. I, I've always stuck to Terran and with Warcraft 3 it was humans. Yeah. I don't know there's something about uh, I guess I'm a, a xenophobe or something <laughs> against aliens. I don't know. Um, but I also um, as far as league, I'm not a, I'm not the greatest player. I have a great relationship with StarCraft 2 and I'm okay sitting in the silver in the silver league area there you of go. play. Um, but that's because I don't put in the time and I'm, uh, I'm okay with that. I understand sure, that I'm yeah. not going to be able to dedicate those number of hours to really climb the ladder up to master, grandmaster's level. And well, this, is, this is a standalone, right? So yes. if, if you haven't been part That's of- That's actually a great point. Yeah, if you haven't been part of the StarCraft II inductee journey, journey yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. you can start without you having- just jump right in yeah. and play it. You will, uh, from a story perspective, I, I do highly recommend Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm. Uh, to get you up to speed, but it does start, gives you enough input to understand where things are at that moment. It's very Protoss focused in the beginning. Um, so you, it, it, it does stand alone in its own chunk, and of course you can buy it in that way if, if that's how you want to consume it initially. Was that, was that hard, just from a story perspective, to try to figure out how do we finish the story for all the people who have played before, but also invite people in in a way that makes perfect sense and it actually, is its own compelling story? It, it wasn't as difficult as I, I think we you might expect because we had this, they are tightly packaged moments in, yeah. uh, in stories, so you can bring them online with very little intro um, into it because it's so Protoss focused in the beginning of, of the game. That's so great. Well, uh, congratulations, good luck. Thank you so much. I can't wait I can't to see the eSports finale as yeah. well. Oh my so. gosh, I know. Well, thank you so much to Chris Sigety. Uh, we have Diablo 3 game director Josh Mascara coming up in just a couple of minutes, but first we're going to take a look at patch 2.4, which features three brand new zones to explore, each inhabited by some of the most unique and menacing creatures in all of Sanctuary. Here's a sneak peek at patch 2.4 for Diablo 3. In patch 2.4, we're adding a lot of new content for players who love exploring the world of Sanctuary, including three new zones, Grey Hollow Island, the Eternal Woods, and we're opening a new wing of Leoric's Manor. Grey Hollow Island is a haunted coastal forest. It's constantly raining, it's bleak, it's dangerous, it's filled with creatures and fauna that want to kill you. It's a horrible, horrible place. In the forest, you have some Sasquatches. You have the, the Silverback and the Bonebreaker, massive furry beasts. You have wasps. Our players love the wasps, so we've made a wasp nest. We have the Hive Mother, who is a variant of the Rat King, except she shoots wasps at you. And then in the cave itself, we have a series of more aquatic creatures, uh, such as the Amputator and the Flesh Harvester, which are a small crab and a very, very big crab. And then uh, the Abyssal Collars and the Abyssal Protectors, which are sort of Jabba mermaids, if you can imagine. The lore in, in Great Hollow Island is, is, is very interesting, and there is a, a mystery that you're going to have to unravel. It's going to take you a little while to figure out. And for our more dedicated players, those who know the lore on their fingertips, they'll be able to tie some of this back to the rest of the game. It's, it's a little hidden. Only, only the, the very best of the best will figure it out, but some of them will, I know.
The Eternal Woods, uh, it's a snowy forest that is just outside of the ruins of Sephron. Uh, players are used to appearing in front of the ruins of Sephron and running forward, and it turns out that if they just turned around, there's a whole new zone behind them, and they could have gone there all along, sort of. It's got most of the monsters that you find in the ruins of Sephron, as well as uh, some undead that sort of have managed to survive in, in the permafrost of that forest. Our players will remember that when you enter Leoric's Manor, there's a majestic staircase in front of you, and on the right side of the staircase is some rubble that's blocking it. And now that rubble's gone, and you're going to be able to go into the right wing of Leoric's Manor and explore that space which you've never been to before. What excites me the most about Patch 2.4, about the new zones we're adding, is really that we're trying new things in all of them. Uh, we're trying different things from what we've done before with the story, with the monsters, with the space itself. Players are going to be finally getting those new spaces, exploring them, exploring the adventures there, and going to discover all the cool new stuff we've added. So much great stuff coming to Diablo 3 that we figured, what, who better to talk to us about it than Josh <laughs> Mascara, dire game director of Diablo 3. Josh, I am so happy you're here. <laughs> I feel like this entire BlizzCon, I've just been waiting for someone to come sit in that chair and talk to me about Diablo this 3. Is, uh, we call him Prince Albrecht. Oh, that Prince is awesome. Prince Albrecht. Yeah. yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I mean, this has been a very, it's a very special BlizzCon for us. The main thing we wanted to do is really celebrate our community. And the two best ways we can do that is announce our biggest patch to date. Yeah. It's not only going to be the biggest, but I hope it's going to be the best. We had like a whole new area to the game, like Grey Hollow Island, yeah. yep. set dungeons, a bunch of changes to the game itself, but more stash space. Yes, Who yeah. exactly. More stash space. Honestly, we, we, in the yeah. PR meeting, and when they said that, I was like, yeah. Yeah. I got it's up, so ran out the room. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So uh, talk to me quickly about the set dungeons. I mean, that's one of the things that jumped out as just a really great way to get, as they were saying, a way to teach people how to use the set, which I didn't even think about. I just thought it was a cool thing to do. So talk to us a little bit about the concept of the yeah. set dungeons. So set dungeons really started off from, so every once in a while we do these game jams where we you know, just get together as a team for a couple of days and come up with a bunch of really crazy, awesome ideas. And in fact, I a lot of the, one of these game uh, they're, they are <laughs> epic, they're epic. There's some really wacky stuff. But uh, Alex Solman, who's a designer who's been really sort of pushing forward the idea of set dungeons, he just had this really great idea of like, okay, if sets are the pinnacle, the yeah. items you're hunting for and slaying all the demons for, it would be nice if we can celebrate them, more than just the fact that you get to wear them, but what if we can create this really yeah. awesome set dungeons. Experience. where Yeah, so we really get to sort of challenge the player in a fun way, and they get some really cool rewards for going through that. And it's just going to be one of those things that I hope that you know, we've been having a lot of fun playing them, and I hope that when the feature goes out live, that people will have a lot of fun and sort of like, and we're going to keep evolving, see what, what yeah. comes out of them and, you know, what people really love about them. And I love that you have to kind of find out where they yeah. are. You know, I'm going to try to not just search online. I'm going to be like, no, that would I be, want to find them. That would be, and that's the other really cool thing with um, the fact that we added adventure mode to the game. It's become this great yeah. vehicle for us to be able to add more content to the game. But we're also trying to find new ways of adding story that really supports the way that people really play our game. Sure, like, yeah, people of People don't course. play Diablo linearly. You yeah. know, they, they play it over and over and over yeah. and over again. So we added set dungeons, these things, these mysteries you got to try to solve. Grey Hollow Island has a cool little story baked into that. Same thing with the new area in the Oryx Manor. So really trying to find cool ways of adding story that feels like it fits the adventure mode way that people play D3. You know, Alex and I both play on PC, and uh, a lot of my friends that are on console, they get a little jealous because, you know, we get these kill streak rewards. Right. Are we going to see that on console? You know, that's one of the things we announced that, uh, you know, we're making a bunch of changes to the PC. It has been announced. We are bringing action combat across from the PC versions of the game Amazing. to the PC cool. versions of the game. So, and it's, it's a really fun way. It really changes your moment to moment gameplay. You now sort of really care about making sure you keep that kill streak going as far as you can. And how are they working? I heard that there was something else too about the uh, destruct, like just the uh, the environment, destructing the environment. That yeah. So there's there's, well. there's two types of rewards. There's the the kill streak, so the massacre as we call them, and there's also the other one 
is the, the more you're destroying the environment, because what else are you going to do with barrels but smash them? Kill them! So the more barrels you smash, the faster you're, you'll get a small speed bonus to really oh, encourage to go yeah, the going speed bonus, yeah, 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 yeah. So those are the two things from Action Combat that we're bringing across to PC. Great. And you guys did a, a, a couple UI changes that, a, 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 you know, as a player, are really helpful. I, you know, Sunwuku Monk pops into your game, yeah. and all of a sudden you're like, I don't know. Especially now that <laughs> Focus and Restraint have kind of become the end game go-to, now that we have Kanai's Cube, that buff bar, I mean, sometimes stuff didn't even show up on that buff bar right. if yeah. it didn't pop. So can you talk to us a little bit about the consolidated buff bars and how you figured about this packing was, in that stuff? This was for all the reasons you mentioned. We realized that our, our poor buff UI wasn't buff enough. <laughs> so we really needed to so to spend a lot of time thinking about the right way of displaying information. Like, it's not a matter of always having them all up there, because then it just becomes like a crazy mess to figure out what's yeah. really important sure. and what isn't. But we've, you know, we really listened to a lot of feedback from our community. We did a lot of iteration, and I think what we finally ended up with is a really good balance between functionality, usability, accessibility, and more importantly, getting the information you want when you need it the most. Oh man, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, we do have a few questions from awesome. Twitter for you. So our first one comes from the angst. The angst says, "When will we see what's going on with the Immortal Throne? How much ooh, longer ooh, ooh. until the time is right?" Well, they might have to. Be, we wait a little bit more. <laughs> um, KG, yeah. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, they, in, in so many ways, we are like we're not done with Reaper Souls. I think that's the most exciting part of, of where we are that um, both internally within the team and within Blizzard, but also with our community, like we're in some ways just really getting started in terms of really figuring out what really makes the gameplay of Reaper th that awesome experience. It's really going to cement the legacy of D3 for the years to come, right? So yeah. we're really, I mean, we're just having so much fun. It's also being able to release content at a good rate. Yeah. You know, no, no longer going dark for a year and a half, two years, and then something. You know, every couple of months, we fundamentally try to change the game. We add some crazy features, like the Runes of Sessions, Kanai's Cube, yeah. Set Dungeons. Yeah. I mean, these are really big, meaty patches, and it's awesome to when be able Kanai's to. When Kanai's Cube came out, I thought you were breaking the game. I was like, you can't do that. That You can't do that. And then it now is just changed the whole aspect of the end game. I have uh, a, another question about um, the uh, seasons when you play through, you're sort of enticing people to play through the story again in Seasons now, because at the end of each of the acts, you're going to be getting pieces of uh, one of the sets, so that by the time you're 70, you theoretically have at least one of the sets. But, so my question is, I might get some of those pieces at level 12, at level 30. Uh, are they going to scale up to level 70? Am I going to be able to use the full set at level 70 as a level 70 items, or how is that going to work? I, that's one of the things that um, I believe that's how it's, it's going to be working, is one of the, I, when we go to PTR, that's, I, again, we want to make sure that we're not breaking anything, because yeah, yeah. it, it would be terrible for us to break anything. And I think the philosophy is, if these sets are really going to be the reward, they're not much of a reward if they're a level 12 set and something right. like that. So again, we really need to figure, see how things evolve. Yeah. But if they're going to be rewards, I mean, fundamentally, we want them to feel like rewards. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know how to do it with the Gem of Ease, which has been fantastic, allowing that Good. to scale up, almost sort of like heirloom items in Absolutely, uh, yeah. Warcraft. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. You guys have so much stuff going on. Josh, thank you. Thank you for so, stopping so by. So much for stopping by. Now let's send it over to Malik, who's standing by with an eSports update. What's going on over there, Malik? I've heard it's crazy. Crazy it is indeed. Guys, you know, when I came out to BlizzCon, I did not know that I was securing my one-way ticket to Upset City. There are so many upsets happening out here, starting off with Hearthstone. Man, the Hearthstone tournament is getting real. We already have one player in the Grand Finals. There was a match between the Dutch Deckler himself, Tice, and Oskata. Oskaka, in a surprising turn of events, was able to come out on top. His freeze mage deck was just too much for Tice to handle. And throughout the match, you saw Tice being very frustrated, putting his hand in his, his head in his hands. He was just completely frustrated. And Tice, he's now out of the tournament. So Oskata is going to move on. And on the other side of the bracket, we have Hot Farm and No going one on one against each other. Like I said before, Hot Farm is the last remaining North. American player in the tournament so it's going to be interesting to see if he can pull this out now I said upset city earlier 
There are some serious upsets happening in Heroes of the Storm. In a run back of the European Championship, Team Dignitas was able to take out Navi today. This is completely unexpected. A lot of people were expecting Navi to be all the way to the finals, but Team Dignitas will be moving on. And on the other side of the bracket, we have Cloud9 squaring off against Team DK from Korea. And we're going to see who's in the grand finals after that. They'll be facing off against uh, Team Dignitas. I told you guys earlier, do not sleep on the European teams. And right behind me, right behind me, the match between Life just took place. Life is moving on to the grand finals now. This is big because he's going for a second year in a row. This is history in the making. Nobody's ever been able to do that. He was able to take out Classic. Classic actually played the most solid match against him that anyone's played. He's been very aggressive the way he's been playing, just rushing his Zerglings in. Classic had good defense for a couple of matches, put Life back against the wall, but Life was able to pull it out in the end, and he is going to the grand finals for the second year in a row. Now the other side of the bracket, SOS and Rogue, the match is getting ready to kick off right behind me, so I'm going to sit down, post up, and check out what goes on with this match. In the meantime, I'm going to send it back to the desk with Alex and Michelle. Thank you very much, guys. Hey, Malik, wow. thank you so much. That was amazing. God, I life, can't believe life made it through. Life is going insane right now. Yeah, that was crazy. I can't wait to see more. But first, we have another Warcraft panel coming up at the bottom of the hour. But first, have you ever wondered how many artists and designers it takes to create the expansive environments in World of Warcraft? Well, the answer might surprise you. So here's a look behind the scenes at the highly anticipated expansion, Legion. I'm Chris Robinson, I'm the art director of World of Warcraft. A brief description of the new hero class, the Demon Hunter. These are night elves and blood elves who were essentially conscripted into the service to fight against the demons using their own power. They were part of an ancient army that was brought to life once we were, realized like this threat that was coming at us and kind of brought them out of hibernation or, their, or where they were currently at to fight against this power that we realized is much stronger than something that we could probably handle on our own. To discuss the art team as a whole, I think we typically talk a lot about the leadership team of WoW when we're at BlizzCon and how those people form the vision and work together to create the art that you see in the game. But we really wanted to take a look this time at the team and the team members and the, what they do to pull their collective vision together to form what we know as the game. We have a character team, a dungeon team, an environment team, a prop team, an animation team, and a technical art team. And it's a combination of all those ideas and all those people coming together that creates what we have. The character art team creates all the creatures, player characters, bosses, pets, armor sets, and weapons for the game. Demon Hunter has a lot of customization with horns, blindfolds, different muscles, different textures, uh, a lot of tattoos, patterns, colors, so players will have a lot of different customization. The environment team, along with the exterior level designers, work on the largest art asset of the game. I'm talking about the world. So when we started working on this expansion, we were expecting to do small encounters of the Legion all around the Broken Isle. But when we started exploring more into the Legion and what they could be, we decided to do a Legion homeworld, which players have never seen before. So the art team just went crazy with that. We explored what an entire planet that was destroyed by the Legion would look like. The prop team uh, works on props, staging, and effects. We have to tell a story with how we stage everything. When a player walks in and you've staged everything right, they should be able to tell exactly what's going on, what kind of uh, person uses that camp. So with the Demon Hunters, it was just lay everything out so that it looks like that story, that these guys are uh, nomadic and on, on the way to war, that they're hunting demons. So it's the staging as best as we can is meant to convey that. The tech art team works on a variety of processes, tools, things that enhance the artist's productivity, allows them to focus on making art as opposed to wondering how are they gonna get this art into the game. 
One of the many responsibilities of the TechArt team is rigging. Rigging is a matter of putting controls, uh, ways of manipulating the underlying skeleton inside of creatures and characters that the animators will use to bring life to those models. The animation team gives life to all of the characters, creatures, and dungeon bosses. To reflect the animations for the Demon Hunter, we used Illidan as a reference point. We knew we wanted to have the player feel like they were playing Illidan. And so we had a lot of combat animations uh, follow what he did. The dungeon team works on all the architectural elements in the game that you interact with, including dungeons and raids. We worked on the prison of the wardens where all the demon hunters were imprisoned. So we had to figure out what that prison would look like, what kind of architecture would be able to hold that many demons. It's night elf based, so we tried to infuse a little bit of that design into, into the architecture as well. We used materials like stone and, and uh, dark metal to emphasize that it's, it is a prison. There are no people, there is no one person, there are no group of people that are dictating and creating the ultimate vision for what we do. It's a process of collaboration amongst all the artists on the team and each individual voice and unique view makes what we know to be Warcraft. Without all those views and all those unique voices, it's nowhere near as creative or as awesome as we've uh, been able to make it. beautiful that game can be, you know I, I mean? know, and it's such an incredible team. They really do have an amazing team up there. They're fun to visit, everything. They're oh. great people. Well, look, as you guys have seen this weekend, Malik has been checking out our show floor, and yesterday he stopped by the T-Mobile booth to get some information on what they are providing the attendees here at BlizzCon. The internet is serious business, especially when you're at a gaming convention filled with smartphone signals that are jamming your reception. But I'm here with Mike Belcher, who works for T-Mobile, and he's gonna tell us a little bit about what they're doing to help mitigate those issues that you have with internet connection. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. This is a fantastic two days here in Anaheim. Yeah, is this your first BlizzCon? Uh, this is my second BlizzCon, okay. but this is the first time that T-Mobile has sponsored BlizzCon. Nice, nice. So what are you guys doing to help with like Wi-Fi connections here? Sure, so I mean, we wanted to make, I mean, we're here in a big convention center. We wanted to make sure that everybody had a great mobile experience. Um, there is so much great information to share. There's so much excitement. People want to tweet it out. They want it, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, or Periscope. We want to make sure that they're allowed to share that, stay connected. So we're offering free Wi-Fi to everybody here in the convention center. So every attendee wow. can stay connected, even if you're not, uh, you know, with T-Mobile on our data strong network. Wow, wow, you, my friend, are what many would say or call the real MVP <laughs> for doing that. Uh, but, you know, what's a good cell phone connection if my phone is dead all the time and I need to charge the battery? Do you guys have anything to help mitigate, like, my, my phone dying? You know what? We got that covered, too. We, we, we say we're all about limiting pain points, yeah. and, um, and charging is one of those. And so we have charging stations located throughout the entire convention center, and, of course, we have this area right here this little lounge you can charge up your phone so right. again you're, you're you're always connected and and you're always got the power you need well i'll tell you this i might come sit at your booth and play some overwatch on my laptop because okay. i like to be mobile at all times oh, yeah. but thank you very much mike for your time Absolutely. we're going to keep going around and talking to people so i'll see you guys very soon you know it's so nice that they actually have telephone companies that are helping out at conventions because charging, look knows, stations. charging stations are needed 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 and it's great that malik's out there meet Meeting everybody. I know. Having talking, a good time. Shaking hands. Not just covering all the crazy esports that's been I happening. I know, right? We've been having a really fun time here at the deck. Yeah, this has been great. Lots of cool guests. Yeah, a lot of great guests. I know you're very excited about everything Diablo. So. I was so glad we had somebody from Diablo. I just was Diablo. like, I'm going to let Alex just go insane on this because he is so excited and he knows how much of a dork I am about Warcraft. So. Uh, well, speaking about dork about Warcraft, we've got so much more <laughs> Warcraft coming up. We're going to send it over to Hall D for the World of Warcraft Q3.